Mother's Day, go ahead and come on in and find your seats. We are so excited that you're here and we say a special happy Mother's Day to all the ladies in the room. Give it up for the ladies in the room. Oh yeah. We're so happy you're here. We love you and we have special treats for you today. So if you're here with family or friends, make sure you grab a picture out in the foyer. There's a beautiful floral arrangement there for you to take a picture. And also, if you head back this way to City Coffee after service, you're gonna find those beautiful pink boxes. You know what they are, the crumble cookies. They're there for you. So every single woman in the house gets a cookie today, so don't forget to go back there and grab one. We are so excited you're here. And we also want to say a special hello to our first-time visitors. Maybe you've been here a few times before, or it's been a long time, or today truly is your first time. We are so glad that you're here, especially on Mother's Day. Maybe you came to worship with mom, and we would love to connect with you. So if you would, feel Fill out a connect card. There's some in the seat back pockets in front of you. There is also a digital one. If you scan that QR code, you'll see it. And then also out in the foyer, you'll see some amazing hosts with red lanyards and they would love to give you a coupon for a free coffee from our city coffee shop. So I hope that you'll go and get one of those from our guest services hosts out there. Well, we want to say thank you so much for your faithful giving to our church and the ministry here. We have something super exciting happening at the end of third service today. We're going to be baptizing some people who are giving. Yes, they are saying it out loud that they are following Jesus, right? And we don't just stop there. We are not just baptizing people and then sending them off, right? We are passionate about discipling people, keeping them close, walking alongside them as they walk with Jesus. And so because of your giving, we are able to do that. We're able to move forward forward in our youth ministry, in our kids ministry, even our adult ministries, and walk alongside people in their relationship with Jesus as they grow with him. So thank you so much for your giving. There are three ways to give that you can see on the screen. And lastly, before we go into worship, I want to invite you to pray with me. Every single week, we pray for three very specific things because we care about these things. Number one, we always pray for a missionary that we support. We also pray for a local church another church in our city. And then we've been praying through the schools in Edmond Public Schools. And let me tell you, there's only one week of school left, and I promise you they need our prayers even more now than ever, right? So would you stand with me, and would you join me in praying for Adam and Bethany Weatherly in Spain, for Deer, Tree, Deer Creek Church of Christ, and for Ida Freeman Elementary. God, we love you so much, and that is why we're here today. We're here to fix eyes on you, God, to worship you, to reset our gaze on you. God, we just take this time to breathe in your presence and just to say, Holy Spirit, come, and we honor your presence here in this room. And God, we lift up these three specific needs to you today, these three people and church, God, in the school. God, I pray for the Weatherlies as they're ministering to people in Spain. Would your presence go before them? Would you open doors of opportunity and relationship there? God, would you give them creative vision for ways to reach people with your gospel that can change lives? And God, we pray for Deer Creek Church of Christ. God, I pray right now as their services are happening that your presence would be so tangible, that you would be speaking to people. God, that you would give them creative ways to reach the people of Edmond and the surrounding areas. God, I pray that their people would be passionately following you and bringing others alongside them. And God, we pray for Ida Freeman Elementary. God, I pray for their principal, their teachers, God, all their support staff. I pray that you would strengthen them as they finish this year strong. Would you protect them? Would your presence be so known there, God, for all the people, the teachers, and even the students who already follow you and shine your light? Would they do that so boldly that they would impact the people around them? We thank you for the staff there that are pouring into our next generation. And God, we just take this time to invite you to work in our hearts, God, as we worship you, as we sit under the teaching of your word, would you personalize it for us today? Would you help us to see how we can walk more closely with you? We thank you for this time together. It's in your precious son's name we pray, amen, amen. Let's continue to worship.
I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. Oh, I speak Jesus. We speak your name. Oh, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Come on, this is our hope. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Jesus in the 
so good to have all of you here with us today celebrating all of our Spring Creek moms. Can we give it up for all of our mothers in the room? Amen, amen. So, so thankful for all of you. Hey, well, we're going to continue on with our service in a minute. We're going to sing another song, but before we do that, why don't you have a seat? Let's check out this special video today. What's your mom's name? What name? Mommy? Just Yanni. Just Yanni. How old is your mom? Um, hey. really. Um, she looks like she's 100 years old. No, don't say that. I think she's eight and a half. What's your mom's favorite thing to do on her phone? Oh, um, just, um, she, she likes to order and message, and she also likes to take pictures. Uh, she likes to use probably, like, Facebook, I think. Uh, she likes to... Marco Polo. Marco Polo, yes. So, does your mom have any hobbies? What does she like to do? Um, she, I... she likes to do is cook, make things up, and, and put some and put some noodles at the dinner table. She likes cleaning. Yeah, she loves cleaning her room, the kitchen and stuff. She likes the dishes the most. Yeah, she loves the dishes. Yes. She's not good at uh, handstands or progress. Oh That's yeah, okay. she's not uh, She's not very athletic. Does your mom do anything funny? Yeah. yeah. She tells us jokes. She, she, she laughs at us when we do funny faces like this. Uh, she dances really, 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 really funny. He does this. <laughs> does your mom like to go on vacation? Yeah. Where does she like to go? To work. Walmart and Target. Uh, to the beach with me. Does she cook? Yeah, yeah. What do you like that she cooks? Eggs. Eggs. She cooks noodles and, and she also cooks chicken. What's something that she cooks that you don't like? Uh, well, today she kind of cooked this, um, it was the right rice with soy sauce and it tastes so bad. Burned hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Carrots. Carrots. You don't like that. If your mom was a superhero, what would her superpower be? To give the bad guys to the police with uh, the force, like Darth Vader. So moms are busy, so sometimes they can forget things, you know? She, she, she forgot it all about Abby's painting, but we still love her. She forgets they give us money. Mm. She mixes up our names. One, one time she called, called me Coda, my dog's name. If you could get your mom any gift on Mother's Day, what would you get her? I, I would Red give her flowers. And we would also give her a surprise dinner. I would get her Reese pieces and a flower because she loves Reese's. What do you love most about your mom? Um, it's just that, that she plays games with me and like, and I love her so much and she also prays for me. If I could pick any mom, I would probably pick Lindsay because she's a really good mom and she loves us very much. What if you had a different mom? Would you pick her? Yeah. I don't care if she's mad at me or not, I always love her. 
I, I love her and, and she is the most beautiful as person. I danced for nine years and my mom was there. She's my biggest supporter through it all. She um, was always the first person I'd run to after I got off the stage. She always did my makeup. She got me ready and then I'd come home and we'd talk about my dance. And she was just like the best supporter for all those years of my life. My mom was a worker and a planner. She was just always busy and uh, on top of it, always organized. And I think uh, I tend to be that way. You know, I, I, I got that from her and I'm glad I did. Mom and I shared a love for sports and uh, supporting our family, my kids and um, family members in sports. And she was always teaching me things. I think it's not just one memory, it's several. And even in her passing, she was teaching me things. Um, she taught me just that, uh, that people are what matter and differences don't matter, but relationships, people matter. One of the biggest things that's like stayed with me that my mom has taught me is what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus every single day and to wake up and it's a new relationship, like you just keep pursuing that relationship. And she just taught me how important that is and how much it'll change your life. If I had one more day, I'd love to take my mom shopping one more time. I would tell her how much I miss talking to her <laughs> and try to say the things that maybe I didn't, I didn't know I didn't say. I'd remind her what a cheerleader she was for us and what a rock she was for our family and for me. I invite you to stand with us as we sing this last song of worship together. to forget all of the great things you did when did I throw away faith for the impossible and how did I start to believe you weren't sufficient for me and why do I Talk myself out of seeing miracles. You are more than able. You are more than able. You are, you are, you are more.
Wow, what a powerful song. <laughs> he is able. Amen. He is able. We welcome you today. Happy Mother's Day to all of the moms. Happy Mother's Day to you. Thank you. Yes, and it's our super duper privilege today to team teach on a series that we've entitled We the Family. And today's subject matter is there is a role for you to play. You have a role to play play every single one of you in this room and you'll find out soon enough what God's word has to say about that and we are so glad you're here if you're here for the very first time we're super glad and let me tell you you're only a guest once and you're part of our family so that's just kind of how we roll around here we have a worship guide that's I'm sure you received as you came in today and you can follow along as we get to the teaching on that outline but it's customary for us to read God's Word out loud. We, we do that because we like to get the truth of God in the atmosphere. And we know to those who know the truth, the truth will set them free. So God's Word is powerful. And so we say it out loud together. And today, just one verse. I normally have you reading a lot of verses, but today, just one verse. So I'm kind of letting you off the hook a little bit. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 on the screen for you and it's a powerful verse and I want us to say it out loud are you ready yes. let's say it out loud submit to, to one, one another, another out, out of reverence, reverence for Christ. Christ you did such a good job let's do it again submit to one another out of reverence for Christ let's pray together father we do honor your word we thank you that it comes to us with immense purpose skilled to speak exactly what it needs to speak to us and thank you that it goes in places <laughs> where we can't even go it's sharper than any double-edged sword it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart and today Lord we allow the work of your word to work in us father would you be glorified as this inspired word lays on the hearts of your people we thank you for information and the power of information, especially when it comes to your word, uh, how it informs us on belief and behavior. But today we're not just asking for an informing, we're asking for a transforming. And Father, we trust you to transform hearts by the hearing of your word today. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You can be seated. Thank you so very very much we the family you have a role to play so a little boy was talking to his mom one day and he asked his mom mommy where were you born and she said well I, I was born in Kentucky and then he goes on to say well where was dad born well dad was born in Indiana well well what about me mommy where was I born well you were born in Georgia oh he's really taken back by all this information and then he says well what about baby sister where was baby sister born and mommy says well baby sister was born in Alabama then the little boy broke out into this huge grin and said mommy isn't it great that God put us all together <laughs> he got us all together right yeah, Father God did get us all together, and we have a role to play in the family, and that's what we are teaching about today. 
from this great book of Ephesians, the book that we've been in in this entire study on We the Family, and our togetherness in your role to play and mine, we find this powerful truth from Apostle Paul as he lays it out in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And these are the words again, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Actually, that could be the summarization of the entire book of Ephesians, submitting to God and submitting to one another. Submission is a challenge. It's a work. It's a privilege. And we learn today from God's word that we can do it. (laughs) We can do it by his grace. What does submission mean? Well, it literally comes from the original meaning of to come under authority or under someone's role. When it comes to what the Bible teaches about submission, we can know this. Submission equals service. Submission equals service. We can only serve one another when we submit to one another. This is where we get the idea of and practice of serving. We can't really serve if we're lording it over someone or if we assume that our role is more important than theirs. We have to come under them in humility and say, wait a minute, I get to serve you. And submission equals that service. Well, and today we just want you to recognize that when we're talking about these roles, we're talking about a Christ-centered home. And if your home does not reflect Christ-centeredness, in other words, if the Lord isn't the Lord of your home, if your home isn't led by Christ-centered ethics, no matter how much good might be represented in your home, there is really eternal hopelessness there without Christ as the head of your home. So Christ-centered homes mean that the roles we play in the home is about serving the Lord by serving one another. And it's so so important that we remember that. So we want to just take the next few moments to identify and talk through the roles of the family. And the first one that we actually would like to cover today is singles. And by singles, we are talking about a way of life, not your identity. Because you are either living single because you've never married, Um, maybe you're just not married presently, or maybe you have gone through a divorce or you are widowed. Your role in our church, in the church, is equally as important as any other role represented among us. And we want you to know today that you are family. You know, even as we prepared and thought about, well, what roles do we want to touch? Because we're just skimming the surface. We really felt nudged by the Holy Spirit to include those of you who are single. Because we want you to know that you are a critical family member here. So just allow us for a few moments to speak to this truth. Singles live in comfort as you uniquely serve the Lord. Yeah, we, we want to challenge you to live in that comfort, singles, as you uniquely serve our Lord. When we talk about a way of life versus uh, an identity, uh, I, am, I am not identified as a married person. I'm identified as a person who finds his identity in Christ. My way of life is marriage, but your way of life may be different. Your way of life may not be marriage. You, you may be waiting to be married, or you choose, you've kind of played that game, you don't want to do that anymore. Well, here's the point. This is so critical that we lean into the whole biblical framework of role-playing in God's church. Singles live in comfort. Be comforted as you uniquely serve the Lord. So we're going to jump out of Ephesians just for a moment, and we're going to look at what Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. He says this, I say this as a concession, not as a command, but I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God. I want you to remember that phrase, of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. So maybe you're sitting there thinking, I didn't even know that 
the Bible would address singleness. Well, not only does it get addressed here, but it's endorsed by Apostle Paul, who is single at this part in his life, and he says it's a really good thing for a lot of reasons, and he, he accentuates a primary reason, but he talks about a concession, not a command. It's a concession is an allowance or agreement to improve a situation. Singles were looked down upon during that time in which Apostle Paul was teaching this, and if you were single, something must have been wrong with you, right? Or you were treated differently than anybody else in that society. And Apostle Paul comes along and he says, Oh, no, wait, Jesus changes the playing field. Everybody is equal. Everybody's important. Everybody is valuable. And we so thank God for that. And Apostle Paul says, hey, you know what? It might be better that you're not married to start with. Think of it in these terms. There is a clearer focus in your life. There is, a, there is an ability to, to be undivided in your loyalties. He says, um, you're, you're going to serve the Lord in a way that married people may not be able to serve the Lord. You're going to serve the Lord without the cares and the concerns of marriage and family life. Now, if you want to be married, I'm not suggesting that this is a discouragement not to be married. Marriage is a gift, as the Scripture says, but so is singleness. And so we just want to just take some time to encourage you in this comfort life, just like marriage is a comfort life because they're gifts from God, in this comfort life, life and say, you uniquely serve the Lord in that dynamic. So some years ago, I received a call. I was out of town on a meeting, and I received this phone call, and when I recognized who it was on my phone, I immediately wanted to talk to this person because I just had recently conducted the funeral for her husband, and so I was concerned about her. So when I saw her number come up, I picked it up, and, and I, I greeted her, and she immediately burst out in this exclamation, oh, Pastor Darren, I, I wanted to tell you about my recent prayer time. It is amazing. I mean, I'm walking around my house. I'm walking this direction and that direction without any interruptions. I'm getting major revelations from God. It's so amazing. And then she goes to say, I love my husband. I miss my husband, but I am enjoying my prayer time. And I thought that was so cute, and it was quite profound. It brought me to a level of understanding, wait a minute, she no longer has the cares of life that she did. She's entering into a new season. She doesn't like that, but she's learning to enjoy it because she recognizes it as something that God is gifting her in. And I love that because this is what I believe understanding the value of family life is all about. So I believe the Lord would want us to encourage you singles to live in the comfort of knowing that you have a unique service unto the Lord. Marriage is a gift. Singleness is a gift. Enjoy this season whether you're on the precipice of being married or you're, you're done with marriage or you're living with the heartache of brokenness from either a past marriage or you're being widowed, understand that you can enjoy this season by God's grace and you can be encouraged by the family of God around you. You can cherish it and you can walk confidently in the unique service that you have to the Lord. So we'd like to finish up with a... Um, a, a reflection question after every section that we're covering today, which is only a couple more. And here's a reflection question for singles. How can I, as a single adult, uniquely serve the Lord in this season of my life? I love that. That's so good. And we have so many amazing singles here in our church family that serve the Lord and serve one another so yeah, well. So I we just so want you to know how important you are today. Uh, the second area of roles that we're teaching on today um, from Ephesians is husbands and wives. And husband and wives live in mutual submission as you uniquely serve each other. Mutual submission. It's unique to each one of us, but it's a mutual submission. Yeah. Ephesians 5 Verse 22 and 23 speaks to wives. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. And then verse 25 and 26 says, For husbands, this means love your wives 
just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. So we see instruction there to husband and wives. And it's about this idea of submission. And how many times we don't want to go here because there's a real threat, I think, for many times for us ladies. But as we look back, even in that verse 21 that we read at the very beginning, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It is submission on both sides. He's not going to let any of us off the hook because there is a service to one another that the Lord wants us to walk in. But wives, wives submit to their husbands as a way of serving the Lord. Remember, we are talking about Christ centered homes. So you aren't meant to submit to your husband if he's going to cause you to disobey the Lord. I mean, there's parameters here that we are talking about. But since we will deal with husbands in a moment, practically speaking, when we as wives live in submission, we're really just giving space to our husband to guide the home. And that's how God instituted the marriage. I'm just going to admit to you, I haven't always done this very well. I was a pretty independent gal when I met Darren, and I was ready to take life and to do my thing. And it's been a journey for me, learning how the blessing of the Lord comes as I serve my Lord in submission to my husband. Because you know, the life that we live, a biblical life, a biblical home, it looks so different from the way the world lives. The pressures, the identities, the things that we um, face from the outside world, this looks a lot different. So let me just say real quickly, so how you might say, can we practically give space for our husbands to lead in the home? Well, in our home, I express my opinion, but then I allow my husband the opportunity to lead in the decision making. I feel like my opinion, I, oh, yeah, 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 I know, I know. He wants to give commentary right there, no, right? No, I, I do want to give commentary. <laughs> um, and what I want to say is her voice is extremely persuasive. <laughs> That's what I want to say. Well, he's very gracious to listen to my voice and to my opinion at times. But then I have to know, but that's the responsibility the Lord has given him to be the ultimate decision maker. And he's going to be the one that's responsible and accountable to the Lord for that. And so how I l allow him the opportunity to lead, it's really important. But yet, he is very um, kind to me and letting that be heard for what I have to say as well. You know, maybe um, it, this is another example. So early on, we, we set our convictions for our home, and one of those things is what we allowed on the television in our home with what we watch on TV or movies. And there's a lot of reasons we will turn off a program. But early on, when there began to be um, noticing the Lord's name being used in vain, Darren was like, that's disrespect to our Lord, so off it goes. And I'd be like, man, did they have to go there? That was, I think, a really good movie. But... I had to appreciate the standard that he felt prompted to lead with for our home. And so I was in total agreement with that wholeheartedly and respected him for taking the lead in protecting our home. You know, another season back when I was pregnant with Ethan, that I, there was a situation that I really wanted to jump into, and it was helping another couple. And though it was very well intended on my part, Darren felt that the timing was bad and that it would cause undue stress and concern for me. And even though I was kind of frustrated at that moment, and I wasn't really necessarily in favor of not jumping into the situation, I allowed Darren to lead in that situation, knowing he is the spiritual leader in his heart, was to protect me and to protect our home. So I just want to say right here to you women and to your wives, I should say, when you continue to resist submission in this area, you will demoralize your husband and his role as spiritual leader will not come as naturally in those moments when it's really needed. And on the positive side, you empower your husband to lead when you give him the space to guide your home. Mm. So my question is for us 
wives to think how we are serving, even in submission to our husband, and ultimately serving our Lord. But ask yourself, how can I, as a way of serving the Lord, uniquely serve my husband? Yeah, and we're living in that culture, like she said, that's it's a Babylonian-style culture where it's very opposed, diametrically opposed to a biblically-based, Christ-centered home. And so everything we're talking to you about may sound a little weird, like they figured it out. No, 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 no. We've not figured it out. We're figuring it out. And we hope we're not too late to the game. But it is a challenge, and it's always before us. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for a pursuit from us to do his will. And he will have his grace available. There's enough grace for you. Did you know that? There's enough grace for me. There's enough grace for all of us. So husbands, here we go. Submit to their wives by using his leadership to serve her. Husbands, submit to their wives by using his leadership to to serve her. So even yesterday, we were running some errands together, and we had dr driven into this parking lot, and I had kind of eyed a couple of parking places, but Michelle quickly in her leadership capacity said, park over there. And, and, and I said, park where? And she said, over there. I said, well, I was going to park over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because she's very persuasive uh, in her tones, Actually, she, 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 was, she was doing just fine. I said to her, uh, aren't you glad I'm agreeable today? And, and when I said that, she kind of gave me that look like, yeah, you better be, kind of. Uh, no, she didn't. I, I, I immediately thought, you know, I probably should be more agreeable. I should be agreeable most of the time, if not all of the time. This is what a marriage expert said. I read this sometime back. 90% of the disagreements in my house I should probably lose as a husband because they are not about the moral and spiritual direction of our house. In other words, I think we trivialize, I think we get into the weeds and we, we minor on the majors and we major on the minors. And sometimes we end up conflicted about things that really don't matter and, and should be acquiescing to our, our beloved spouse. Uh, in particular, husbands should do more acquiescing if, they're, if they have a strong leadership approach to things. I, you know, when it comes to, you know, I know men have a bent on color schemes and that type of thing. You know, I know what looks good, but I don't know how to get there. And so Michelle not only knows what looks good, she knows how to get there. And so if she decides she wants a color, I shouldn't say, I'm not really crazy about that. Bum, 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 bum. You know, that wouldn't be good. Uh, I think the uh, the the, the uh, Godly approach for me, the practical approach, is just to say, how can I serve you in that beautiful color you chose? Or the window treatments, or do you want me to put that up for you? No, I, I, know, I know I'm being kind of facetious here, but in reality, I think this is a challenge from God's Word. Not that we get it right all the time. We should get it right more than we get it wrong if we're empowered by grace. But here's the point. How can I serve you and not make a big deal out of little deals? So here's also what I believe Apostle Paul is saying. He's really saying what it's not before he's saying what it is. And I believe that when we see this word head of the wife, you think, oh, that's just got negative connotations all over the place because we, we, we see it in, often in the English language use of head as the head of a corporation or the boss or the chief officer. And he turns it upside down, Apostle Paul does, and he transforms headship language by redefining it in reference to Jesus. And he says, love your wives as Christ loved the church, which means he gave himself up for her. And so it's a sacrificial dynamic. It's, it's choosing her way above your way unless it comes to the moral and spiritual dynamics of the home. So husbands use their leadership by serving her and their family. Well, and can I just rush to this and say that this is so critically important. Uh, we don't lead by autopilot. We lead by intentionality. We lead by engagement and service in our home. So when it comes to 
understanding our role, we're front and center. We're leading the pack. We're not watching ESPN or playing on our phone when everybody else is doing chores, right, or, or you know, fulfilling their assignments, and we're just kicking back because we're, quote, the head of the house. No, we are leading as servants. We're the lead servants of the home. So, yeah, yeah, we get our hands dirty in the sink, and we make the beds, and we sweep, and, and we get busy engaging in the responsibilities ourselves. And, and, and secondly, when we're at the table, we're not, we're not you know, playing a game on our phones. We're completely and totally engaged in conversation, almost leading that conversation and make sure, making sure everybody's feeling good and, and working through the conflicts. And I know that's not always practical, but it should be more practical most of the time than, than the less of the time. So engagement and service are how we lead. Here's a reflection question for husbands in the room. How can I lead our home in a way that serves her well. And this third last area of roles, we're going to look at parents and children. Parents and children live in tenderness and honor as you uniquely serve one another. Ephesians 6, 1 says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. Yeah. For this is the right thing to do. And then in verse 4 it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Yeah. So practical. So, so, so good. let's deal with the role of children as it is dealt with first here in Ephesians chapter 6. Because Apostle Paul, he quotes the fifth commandment. And he says, honor your father and mother. And children, teens, young adults who live in the home, you express honor to your parents as God commanded you to. By obeying them. Hmm. And here's the critical essence to this. You learn obedience to God by learning to obey your parents. It's so practical. And it's in such a great environment for you to learn hmm. how to trust God as you walk in trusting your parents and learning to obey them. So remember, we're, we are still talking about Christ in our homes. But if we don't learn obedience to our parents... Yeah. We won't learn obedience to God. Yeah. So this is why honoring your parents, this is just real practically critical for your walk even with the Lord. Yeah. So children learn submission to God by learning submission to your parents. My dad used to always say to me, now Darren, you got to remember I'm always right. And all oh, that would make me so mad. I would say, and inside, I wouldn't say it out loud, but I would say inside, man, he's not right. He's not right on this one. He's not right on this one. And looking back, he wasn't always right, but actually he was always right in that season of my life because he was my father. He was the head of the house. He had that spiritual authority over my life. But as I have moved on to become a practicing adult, which I'm still working on, honor has shifted now from obedience to my parents to honoring them by fulfilling my adulthood responsibilities like look dad and mom nothing no, everything that you did I mean there may have been some things you wish that I would have learned but I'm still trying to learn it and look hey I think I'm doing pretty well uh, I honor them by relating well to them I honor them by caring for them I honor them by appreciating what they have taught me and what they're teaching me now by their life example. And the authority of God in my life became more evident because of what I learned in obedience to my parents. So children in the home, here's your reflection question, all right? How can I uniquely serve my parents today and you're sitting there going that's the last thing I want to be thinking about uh, I'm the dependent one come on serve me but here in this whole mutual submission as we've learned in Ephesians 5 21 we know that children aren't off the hook either and then parents so this is the lesson for parents you express tenderness to your children by intentionally training them in the ways of Father God. And you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, I wish that was always convenient. Well, we as parents need to work more diligently at kind of backing off 
thinking about what this moment is with our child and not that they're just a figure of, for our harshness, but an opportunity for us to be engaged to truly minister to them. Uh, parents, we express tenderness to our children when we intentionally train them in the ways of Father God. And when it comes to training, tenderness is expressed in conflicts. <laughs> it's expressed in correction. It's expressed in recreation. It's expressed in mealtimes. It's, it's, it's expressed in devotions and, and, and everyday conversations. That's where that tenderness is fleshed out. All of these come as intentional training opportunities for our children. So we don't want them to look back and say, I never felt the heart of God in our home. Why would I trust his heart now as an adult? The whole idea is that they would never misunderstand the goodness of God in his tender way of dealing with us. And I will tell you, I've offered my share of apologies to my children, Ethan and Emma, over the years. And I think back and, and yeah, I wish I could have done it better and, and could have said it a little differently. Uh, but I thank God for his grace. And, and uh, I think we as parents need to be really good at apologies to our children. Really good at being honest with them and saying, I think I messed that one up. Will you please forgive me? This is what should have happened. This is what I did. I'm thanking God that the grace of God is making up the difference. I, I had to do that a couple of weeks ago after that message, Welcome Home Grace. That night I walked in my daughter's room because I'd been instructing her and I felt like I had done it kind of harshly. And I said, babe, I'm so sorry. Know my heart. I want to always lead you and even in disciplining and instructing you in love and grace. And so we don't always get it right, but thankfully the Lord enables us to get it right. And can I just add to that by saying that uh, gospel-shaped discipline in a Christ-centered home is far less concerned with controlling behavior and far more concerned with character development. So if we're into control behavior or, behavior or controlling behavior, we're going to be tempted to be more harsh, like stop that, <laughs> like grabbing them by the shoulders and saying, stop that. You know, that's good counseling. Just stop it, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and sometimes that's the, that's the lack of patience that we have as parents. But if we'll just step back and say, wait a minute, this is not about controlling behavior. This is about character development. What can I say? How can I convey this? And so we talk a lot about how. We talk how. We talk why a lot. Why do we do this? How are we able to do it by God's grace? And there are harder seasons than others. Different seasons. Maybe you dads, the financial pressures that you're feeling or a situation at work. It can become very stressful in those moments. Or as moms, you know, you're dealing with the kid's schedule and what am I going to cook for dinner and all of those things that sometimes, we, and we are disciplining, training our children. That's part of our roles as parents. But yet sometimes the stresses of life can cause us to not be intentional in making sure that we are showing them discipline and training in the ways of God the Father. Yeah. So what's the reflection question we want them to ask? So parents with children in the home should ask, how can I serve my children in tenderness? Yeah. How can I serve my children in tenderness? Here's the summarization question for all of us in the room. Are you ready? Here it is. How can I better serve others in my role? Yeah. How can I better serve others in in my role. You know, I can't help think as we are reflecting here on the roles that we all play. We had this lived out so beautifully last weekend. We had our women's missions tea and I saw so many of our teen girls, our college girls, just fulfilling their role and serving their church family, um, setting up, washing dishes, doing whatever it took. And then I noticed a beautiful mom and daughter who worked days together on our table decor. And they were serving together, but they were serving the God's family and their Lord. There was one in particular mom that she came up on Friday just to help us set up, even though she couldn't even attend the tea on Saturday because she was serving her church family, because she would be serving her children the next day 
in their schedules and in their activities that she couldn't be a part of. But the one that struck deepest in my heart was watching my own mom. As on Thursday when she knew I was coming up early to do a lot of behind the scenes, she came up with me, washed all of the glass cups for me. She was serving me in her role as my mom. But I've learned by watching her life and over the years, she was serving her Lord by serving me. That's the greatest lesson that we can teach those who are watching us is we serve one another, but most of all, it's in serving our Lord. He gets the ultimate glory out of all of the submission and serving in our lives. So beautiful. And so are you. Let's stand together as we respond to God's word. I want to have a moment to pray over the women that are in the house. That's a really cool responsibility to pray over women and specifically over moms. And then Michelle is going to pray over all of our roles and then we'll begin to conclude our tremendous day of celebration on our moms. Father, we love you. We thank you for how your word has given, been given to us to encourage us today. And I pray for all of the women here, Lord, that you would help them to feel how important they are to the family of God and to their own families and their relationships. Their perspective matters. Their words matter. Their heart matters. The way they engage matters. They are a gift to others. I pray that they would feel that today. I pray for the women in the room who have wished to have a child, but for whatever reason could not. For those who have lost children in miscarriages, Lord, you would be their comfort. Help them to know, Lord, that their womanhood did not diminish, <laughs> but their courage did. And their example and their inspiration has blessed many, many, many I pray your customized, gra customized grace for them. I ask, Father, today for every mother that's in the room that you would bless her, that the way she nurtures and serves and fulfills her role, that you would give her the strength to do it continually, but also for her to know how appreciated she is and valued and, Lord, an indispensable member of the family. We praise you for her. We praise you for them in Jesus' name. And Father, I just pray over every single individual in this room today, Lord, for all of the roles that they play, from our singles to husbands and wives and parents and children. Lord, life can get messy, but we thank you that we can lean into you and your enablement, your strength and your power yes. to fulfill the roles that you have placed in our lives. Yes. Lord, we thank you that you allow us to love and operate in grace. Lord, empower everyone in this place today that as we leave, that we were, we'll be encouraged, Lord. We'll be excited to fill out that role that you have placed on us. I pray your blessings upon every individual that they will know that they are an important part of this family and their families. And as you just keep your heads bowed for a moment, I'm gonna ask the most important question of the day. Where are you with God? Uh, are you following Jesus presently? You know that the moment that we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and begin to follow him with our lives by his grace, God moves from judge of our life to father. And our home in heaven is secure because of the grace of God and our faith that we place in Jesus. And so today, if you have not chosen or are not presently following Jesus, the most important decision of your life rests on what you're going to do with him today. And so I implore you, I implore you as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, follow him and receive life eternal. 
If that's you, when I count to three, I want you just to lift your hand. We, we're not here to embarrass you, but we're certainly here to resource you and to pray with you. And we're going to lead you in a prayer in a moment. If you choose today by the Spirit's prompting to follow Jesus, when I count to three, I want you to lift your hand, okay? One, two, three. Just lift your hand right where you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So many hands. Thank you, Lord, for how you're speaking right now. And we praise you for that. Now, everybody's going to pray this prayer. Everybody in the room, and for those who are responding, just believe it in your heart, okay? Believe it in your heart. And the scripture says, what you believe in, you confess, will lead to your rescue and salvation. So let's pray this out loud. Dear God in heaven, heaven, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I'm sorry for my sins. Make me a new person. Today I confess Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. So I receive my rescue. I receive my salvation. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate that today. Pastor Darren and Michelle for that powerful and so practical word for all of us. I love that they really helped us see our important role, every single one of us. Well, I want to tell you, um, first off, if you prayed that prayer with Pastor Darren and you made the decision today to follow Jesus, that is so important, so powerful, but also important that you do it with community surrounding you. We want to know, we want to connect with you, we want to walk alongside you. So if that's you, Michael and Jaylen are gonna meet you over here at this Follow Jesus banner at the very end of service. If you'll make your way over there, just give them two or three minutes to connect with you and we would love to walk alongside you in that. And also, this summer, or June 19th through 21st, we have our annual VBS coming up. It's for thir- three years old through fifth grade. So if you have kiddos, make sure you hop online and register them. But also, 
there's something for everyone to do here. This is really cool. This is an outreach opportunity for our church. Last year, over half of the kids that came to VBS were not our church kiddos. They were from around the community. That is that is so powerful that we get to partner with our community in that way and to pour into kids from outside the walls of this church. So I encourage you as adults to go online and register. Look for a way that you might be able to serve with snacks or leading a team or there's lots of different things that you could do. Registration. So I challenge you to go there and register yourself too to come to VBS. It's going to be super duper fun. Now, if you have Mother's Day lunch plans and you need to head out, by all means do so. But if you have a few more minutes, I encourage you to stay here. We're going to baptize some people. They're going to give a, yes, yes. So let's do that now. Right. This is Emily. Emily has begun following Jesus in the last couple of years, but uh, just before Easter this year, Alyssa invited her to come to Spring Creek. Uh, she immediately felt at home. This is what it, it looks like when we say you're a guest at, at first and then you're part of the family. Uh, Emily just immediately part of the family. So we're so excited. Emily, have you made the decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And you're going to live for him for the rest of your life, no matter what. That's amazing. Based on your profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Man, I'm excited. We have a, a group of brothers right here, uh, the Fennells family. This is Chris. Uh, they started coming with Richard in Brooklyn. Uh, the older guys were working with Richard, uh, experienced his influence and in, in his invitation and came. They all gave their life to Jesus during our spring break camp and have been pursuing and understanding that relationship. We are so, so proud of them, Chris. You're leading the way for your brothers. You're changing generations in your family, and I'm proud of you. Have you made the decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you want to live your life for him no matter what? It's incredible. On, based on that profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Kobe. Kobe was like, made my heart's racing. He's so excited. Kobe, have you made the decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And you want to live for him no matter what, the rest of your life. Based on that profession of faith, Kobe, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Tony. I love this dude. Tony, have you made the decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And you're going to live for him for the rest of your life. Amen. Well, based on that profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
All right. This is my man, Vinny. And Vinny, have you made the decision personally to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior? And you're going to live for him for the rest of your life, no matter what. That's incredible. I'm proud of you. Based on your profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. to baptize my firstborn daughter. So, Nora, have you made the decision to follow Jesus for your whole life and make him your life leader? Yes. All right. Well, upon your profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 